I wonder if um, you have made any New Year's resolutions this year. We hear about them. We hear about them every year. Um, beginning of beginning of January, you'll hear this type of thing. This is the year that I'm finally going to get in shape. I'm going to join a gym, or this year I'm going to prioritize spending time with my family, or this is the year I'm going to finally kick that bad habit that I've I've gotten into. Um, we hear New Year's resolutions every every year, and maybe maybe you're you're here this morning and you've made some. Um, but I wonder how resolute you are in keeping your New Year's resolutions. Maybe you've made one this year and a week into January and you'd, you'd given up. You couldn't, you, couldn't keep, you couldn't keep going. Or maybe you're, you're here this morning and you're still plowing on ahead. You're still going strong. I think what determines whether or not we're still, we've thrown in the toil or we're still plowing on ahead is our motivation. Whatever it is that drives us and spurs us onward will ultimately determine whether or not we complete the task ahead, the task that we've set ourselves. And so we're in a, a season of Lent uh, at, at the moment um, in the run-up to Easter. Um, this is another time of year when people tend to set themselves challenges or tasks that so some of us here might have, might have given up something for Lent. Um, last year, um, my housemates and I on... Uh, on a bit of a whim, uh, on the eve of Lent, decided that we were going to give up eating meat for 40 days. Um, and I'll be honest, at the outset, I, I didn't really have any motivation to, to complete this task. Um, I didn't really count the cost, and so I entered into this Lent season with no real resolve. And so inevitably, I fell well short of the 40 days, and I gave in. You see, my, my desire to eat meat outweighed my motivation to complete the task that was, that was set before me. And I think the reason is because whatever our motivation is will ultimately determine whether or not we complete the task that is ahead of us. And so we're in, in this season of Lent again, um, and that means we're in the run-up to Easter, which is a really, truly glorious time in the church calendar. Um, and so as we are on the run-up to Easter this morning, we're going to consider the cross and we're going to be considering the question, why did Jesus go to the cross? We've been thinking about the tasks that we set ourselves, um, either at the beginning of, of the new year or, or during Lent. But now we're going to turn to the task that was set before the Lord Jesus Christ. And while his task, namely enduring the cross, was infinitely greater and infinitely more difficult and infinitely more noble, there's a, a principle that remains, and that is this, that what motivated him and what spurred him on all the way to Calvary was what determined the completion of the task that was set before him and enabled him to cry, it is finished, as he breathed his last on the cross. And so we're going to be asking the question, well, why did Jesus go to the cross? And so if you have a Bible, uh, I'd invite you to turn to Luke chapter 9. Um, we're going to spend a bit of time across Luke's gospel this morning um, as we consider this question, why did Jesus go to the cross? And so we're going to base ourselves here in, in Luke chapter 9. Um, and so if you want to keep your thumb in, in that passage, but we're going to be spending jumping about a bit, a bit in Luke's gospel as we answer this question. But Luke chapter 9, beginning at verse 51. And we're only actually going to read the one verse for now. <clears throat> Luke chapter 9, verse 51 says this, when the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. I'll just read that again. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. This is God's word. This verse, uh, verse 51 of chapter 9, this is the base camp of Jesus and his journey towards Jerusalem. This is the base camp. And a base camp is where you'll often hear about base camps in maybe mountainous expeditions where there'll be a base camp maybe at the foot of Everest, for example. And that's where they really set out on the journey from. And you see here in, in Luke chapter 9, in terms of his earthly ministry, 
when it gets to Luke chapter 9, this is where Jesus is setting out now towards Jerusalem. And this is a verse that we're going to keep on coming back to this morning, verse 51 of chapter 9. And so this is going to be our base camp. Um, So if you keep your thumb in that passage, that'll be great. But you see, from this verse onwards, for Christ, all roads led to Jerusalem. All roads led to Jerusalem. We see that his face was set towards Jerusalem. And from this verse onwards, for for the rest of Luke's gospel, he repeats this again and again. He makes it very clear that Christ is on his way to Jerusalem. His face was set toward the city. And so in in chapter 13, verse 22, he says this, he went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. Or in chapter 17, verse 11, on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. Or in chapter 18, verse 31, and taking the 12, he said to them, see, we are going up to Jerusalem and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. You see, for Jesus, all roads lead to Jerusalem. Why was this? What business did Jesus have in Jerusalem? Why did he set his face towards the city? Well, we see the answer in the, in the passage that we've just read in Luke 18, where Jesus says, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man that is Jesus, by the prophets, will be accomplished. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles, and he will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him. And on the third day, he will rise. You see, this is what awaited Jesus in Jerusalem. This is what his face was set toward. You see, he would soon enter Jerusalem triumphant on Palm Sunday, which God willing we'll be, we'll be looking at next week. But not even a week after that, we would see him on a hill outside the city being crucified. And this is what Jesus had set his face toward. We see in Luke 18 that Jesus knew that this was his destiny. He knew that this is what awaited him. And yet, he was resolute in his mission to fulfill it and to accomplish the purpose for which he came and so coming back to our base camp, to Luke 9, 51, we ask the question then, why did Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem? Or we might even say, why did Jesus set his face to go to the cross? What was the reason? What was his motivation? And that is the question we're considering this morning. And as we do consider it on this run up to Easter, it is my hope that this morning you will see afresh the glory of the cross. That you will see again the Savior who we can say with Paul loved me and gave himself for me and that you might see something of the steadfast determination of Jesus to ransom a people for God. That's my hope this morning. And before we consider this question of why why did Jesus go to the cross, um, we'll briefly ask another. And that is, what does it mean that Jesus set his face to go to the cross? Or as the NIV says, resolutely set out for Jerusalem. What was what does this mean? And so we're going to consult an, an Old Testament prophet to help us. And so I warned you, if you want to flick in your Bibles back to Isaiah chapter 50, um, and we'll briefly consider that passage, Isaiah chapter 50. And we see in this, in this passage, we see the voice of a suffering servant. And you might recognize it as the same voice as the suffering servant of Isaiah chapter 53. Some of us will be familiar with the famous passage where it says that the Messiah will be pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. Here in chapter 50 of Isaiah, we see the same suffering servant, and this time he's speaking. And listen to what he says. In verse chapter 6, he says this, 6 and 7, I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting, but the Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint, and I know I shall not be put to shame. We know this suffering servant to be none other than Jesus Christ. And so we see Jesus facing his flogging, this flogging and this spitting 
with his flint-like face set toward it, not away from it. Now, I'm, I'm not much of a geologist, um, but according to an internet search, flint is a form of quartz, which is extremely hard and weather resistant. Basically, it's a material and a mineral of incredible strength. And so you can see the picture that's being painted for us here in Isaiah chapter 50. That's this, this is a servant who is facing his suffering with flint-like resolve and determination. As I said before, the Messiah was to be pierced for our transgressions. He was to be crushed for our iniquities. And yet he stood before it with steadfast determination. And why? Well, Isaiah tells us, for he knew the Lord God to be his helper and his vindication. And back to base camp, Luke chapter 9, verse 51. It is with this same attitude that we see Jesus set his face towards Jerusalem, isn't it? The same resolve, the same determination. And so our question is, why? Why? What, what fueled his determination? Where was his resolve rooted? What spurred him on all the way to the cross? Well, this morning, we're going to consider four reasons, which I think Luke shows us in his gospel, as to why the Lord Jesus set his face to Jerusalem and indeed all the way to the cross. Four reasons. Jesus set his face to go to the cross in mercy. He set his face to go to the cross in love. He set his face to go to the cross in obedience. And he set his face to go to the cross to win. Four reasons. In in mercy, in love, in obedience, and to win. And so we're going to spend time looking at these four four reasons. But before I do, I just have two short caveats to make. Um, This is by no means an exhaustive list. Um, The riches of Christ, including his life and death and resurrection, are unsearchable. And so I'd encourage you, brothers and sisters, um, why not reflect on this question this week for yourselves? Why not spend time from Luke 9, 51, and read through until chapter 19, where we see Jesus enter into Jerusalem? Why not spend time a little over a chapter a day reading reading about the Lord on his way to the cross? See the Lord on his way to his glory. And I I trust that your hearts will be drawn up to him. Spend time in Luke's gospel this week, I encourage you. Um, Lost my place. There we are. Secondly, Jesus' face was set, in a sense, long before Luke chapter 9, verse 51. Um, the message of Scripture is not that Jesus reached this, this specific point in his ministry in Luke chapter 9 and then decided, I'm going to go to the cross. No. It's actually the message of Scripture is far, far more wonderful than that. Um, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5 says this. In love, he, that is the Father, predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. You see, God the Son, in eternity past, in loving obedience to his Father, agreed to enter into his creation and be subject to death, even death on a cross. And so what we see in Luke chapter 9, is no, it's no spur of, a moment, spur of the moment decision. It's not a decision made on a whim, like me, and my ill-fated attempt to go vegetarian. You know, this, was, this has been the redemption plan from of old, from indeed before the foundation of the world. But however, Luke chapter 9, it does mark a decisive shift and a definitive shift in Jesus' earthly ministry, where in which now, as the days drew near for him to be taken up, all roads lead to Jerusalem. And so now we'll come to the reasons Why did Jesus go to the cross? Well, firstly, Jesus set his face to go to the cross in mercy. It was once explained to me that mercy is not getting something that you do deserve. Okay, so not getting something that you do deserve. And so, for example, there exists in the British monarchy a royal prerogative of mercy, um, wherein which the monarch can can pardon a convicted criminal. It's sometimes called the royal pardon. And so this is an example of of mercy. Um, I would say modern day, a modern day example, but um, yeah, I think it's not sure how, how many royal pardons go on these days, but anyway, um, it's just an example of mercy. And here in Luke chapter 9, we see uh, from the outset of his, of his journey to Jerusalem, right at base camp, 
we see an act of mercy from the Lord Jesus. If you turn with me again to Luke chapter 9, verse 51, and I'll read down to verse 56. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. And they went on to another village. We see here in these verses, James and John, the sons of thunder, really living up to their name, don't we? Um, they, they've gone on ahead of Jesus into Samaria um, to make preparations for him. But we read that the Samaritans did not receive Jesus because his face was set toward Jerusalem. We're not told exactly what this looked like, but we can assume that there was hostility, maybe based on the, that old feud between Jews and Samaritans. And so James and John take offense at the, the poor reception that the Lord Jesus receives in Samaria. And they actually want to call down fire from heaven. And they ask Jesus this. And how does he respond? How does Jesus respond to this request from James and John? Look with me at verse 55. It says this, he turned and rebuked them. Christ with his flint-like face set towards Jerusalem turns for a moment to rebuke his disciples, to rebuke James and John. Why? Well, it's because of his mercy. See, this story, this story, well, maybe, dare I say, seeming quite insignificant in the grand scheme of things, I actually think gives us an insight into the mission of Christ and indeed into the very heart of God. Think about Jesus' words to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. You see, Jesus was bent on salvation, not condemnation. Or think about the words of the apostle Peter in his second letter in chapter 3, verse 9, says this, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Is this not what God is like? Has God not proved this to us in Christ? He's merciful. See, our sins deserve God's wrath. We have offended a holy God. And yet Jesus went to the cross in the most amazing mercy to take the punishment that our sins deserve. Jesus went to the cross to bear God's just wrath in himself so that we might know forgiveness and adoption to sonship. You have never seen mercy like this. You've never seen mercy like it. Are we then, as Christians, not to be a merciful people? When we see the immeasurable mercy shown to us in Christ, should we not too be merciful? When we see the forgiveness shown to us in Christ, should we not to forgive? This is why Jesus, um, when he's teaching his disciples to pray in in Luke chapter 11, just uh, uh, a page or two ahead on his journey to Jerusalem, he stops to teach his disciples to pray and he says this, and forgive us our sins for for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. You see, as Christians, these two things are inextricably linked to receive forgiveness from God and to forgive others. You can't have one without the other. These things are inextricably linked. And so let us this morning, as we gaze upon the mercy of the cross, may we follow in the footsteps of our Lord and show mercy to those who are indebted to us. Because Jesus set his face to go to the cross for us in mercy. Secondly, Jesus set his face to go to the cross in love. Or to be more specific, Jesus set his face to go to the cross for the love that he has for his flock. Uh, I have a relative called Ivan, uh, who is a sheep farmer, which might not come as a surprise to many of you. Um, But I met Ivan, well, I maybe met him when I was much younger, but I don't remember it. But I I re-met Ivan quite recently uh, at a birthday party. 
my cousin's birthday party. And as well as being a sheep farmer, Ivan is actually a talented singer-songwriter, believe it or not. Um, and so he was asked to perform at this party. And one of the songs that he played actually nearly brought a tear to my eye. Um, it's called The Shepherd. And I'd actually like to read a verse, a verse from it now. It says this. The shepherd is good. The shepherd is kind. He gathers the flock and leaves none behind. He carries the lambs and cares for the sick, searches for the lost, no matter what the cost. The song is based on John chapter 10, where Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. Is there a better picture of Jesus' loving care for his people than that of he is a shepherd and we as the sheep? And what, what is the most loving thing the good shepherd could do for his sheep? What is the greatest expression of his love? Well, Jesus says this in verse 11 of John chapter 10. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus would later say to his followers in chapter, John chapter 15, verse 13, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. We see here from John's gospel that Jesus loves his flock so much that he would lay down his life for the sheep. And now with me, come back again to base camp, Luke chapter 9, verse 51. That we ask again, well, why did Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem, to go to the cross? And well, as Luke records Jesus' journey to Jerusalem, um, we see him teaching in Luke chapter 15, telling a series of parables. And he records Luke records one particular parable in Luke 15 that will be familiar to most of us. It's the parable of the lost sheep. But listen to the question that Jesus asked in verse, in verse 4 of Luke chapter 15. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? Is this not a picture of Jesus' resolve and his determination and his mission to seek and to save the lost. This is why Jesus set his face to go to the cross, to save the lost sheep no matter what the cost. Isaiah chapter 53 says this, Each of us, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Is there a greater love than this? All of us have turned away from God to our own way. We've all wandered away, utterly lost. But Jesus sought us and rescued us from death at the cost of his own life. Greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. And Jesus set his face to go to the cross in love and in the love that he had for his flock. Thirdly, so we've seen so far Jesus set his face to go to the cross in mercy. He set his face to go to the cross in love. Thirdly, we see Jesus set his face to go to the cross in obedience. In obedience. And to do that, we're going to, be, we're going to go back briefly for a moment to the beginning of Luke's gospel, to Luke chapter 2, if you want to turn with me. Luke chapter 2, here we see the, Jesus, or the story of the boy Jesus in the temple. See, Mary and Joseph had begun to make their way back to Nazareth after spending the Passover, celebrating the Passover in Jerusalem, only to find that their son was not with them. And so they turn in a panic, head back to Jerusalem, and upon arriving, they find their son, the Lord Jesus, sitting in the temple. In verse 59, we find our Lord's first recorded words uh, in terms of his incarnation. These are the first recorded words of Jesus that we have. In the scriptures, it says this, verse 49. And he said to them, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? From when he was a boy, Jesus has been chiefly concerned with his father's business. Come with me again to base camp to Luke 9, 51, where we'll now see the man, Jesus, setting his face to go to Jerusalem to obediently carry out his father's business, to go and do his father's business in Jerusalem. In obedience, we see him on his way to the holy city. 
his face set like a flint to do his father's will. And finally, see him praying on the Mount of Olives in Luke chapter 22, verse 42, saying, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Even at this moment, when his soul was overwhelmed with sorrow, even to the point of death, as he knelt in the garden with sweat drops of blood falling to the ground in anguish, Christ was obedient to his Father's will. He set his face to do his Father's will and to achieve his Father's business. Well, what was the Father's will? What was the business of God? Well, I think Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. We've already looked at this verse, but I think it's worth looking at again. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. The Father's will, rooted in love, was that he would adopt children into his family through Jesus Christ. This was the Father's will. This was the Father's business that Jesus was concerned with. This was the Father's business that he was obediently carrying out. This is why he set his face to go to the cross. It was to this end that Jesus set his face to go to the cross. And Paul puts it like this in Philippians chapter 2, verse 8. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus set his face to go to the cross in obedience. Fourthly and finally, we're going to consider how Jesus set his face toward the cross to win to win. Now that might seem strange that as this man from Nazareth hung on a cross, shamed, ashamed and beaten and naked, how is it that this was his victory? How was it that this was his triumph? What actually happened at the cross? Well, Jesus won. He set his face to go to Jerusalem because he knew that the cross would be his triumph. How can this be? How can this be that this public execution with this punishment reserved for the worst of criminals, how can this be Jesus' victory? Jesus said in, in Luke chapter 22, verse 52, as Judas led the mob to arrest him in the garden, he said, have you come out as against a robber? with swords and clubs. When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me, but this is your hour. This is your, this is, all right. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. This is your hour and the power of darkness. This, the following day, would be the darkest day in human history when the perfect son of God was regarded as a, a dangerous criminal deserving of the death penalty. And over the course of the next chapter, chapter 23, chapter, chapter 23 of Luke's gospel, we see this power of darkness that Jesus talks about. We see him mocked and beaten and blasphemed against and falsely convicted after a sham trial and made to carry his own cross on which he would be crucified. This is the hour of utter darkness. The hour of the Pharisees and the chief priests who had been plotting to kill him. This was their hour. And this was what Jesus set his face toward. Remember Isaiah chapter 50 verse 7. The, the Messiah set his face like a flint as he went and endured his appointed suffering. Jesus' resolution and his determination that we see back in Luke chapter 9 verse 51 was for this moment. Why? Why was it? It was because this is his triumph. The cross was his triumph. Even in this darkest hour, Jesus won. As John says in his gospel, chapter 1, verse 5, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. How is this? How can this be? How did Jesus win? What did he achieve? Well, in Colossians chapter 2, um, Paul tells us, Turn with me again, if you'll indulge me, um, to Colossians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. And here I think we see really what we have an insight of what was going on at the cross. What actually happened at the cross? How was this his victory? 
Look with me at Colossians chapter 2, and we'll see. And we'll read from verse 13 to gain context. Chapter 2, verses 13 to 15. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of death that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Notice the two things that are going on here. Firstly, Jesus won the forgiveness of his people's sin. And secondly, he won the spiritual war against Satan and his powers. And we'll briefly look at at each of these. And this is the last thing we'll do before we we close this morning. But we'll briefly look at these two things. Firstly, Jesus won the forgiveness of his people's sin. Paul says in verse 13 that we were once dead in our trespasses and the uncircumcision of our flesh. However, we have been made alive with Christ through the forgiveness of our trespasses. How is this possible? How can we be forgiven of our trespasses? Well, verse 14 says that the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands condemning us has been canceled. The infinite debt that we owed God because of our rebellion against him has been wiped away. How? Again, we must ask, how how is this possible? Well, because it was nailed to the cross. Paul elsewhere in 2 Corinthians verse 5, 21 says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So when Paul says oh, that our legal debt was, which stood against us, our sin was nailed to the cross, he meant that literally. Christ became sin for us he who knew no sin became sin for us this is why jesus set his face to go to the cross to become sin for us so that he could win for us forgiveness and the righteousness of god and this morning if you're here and you haven't received jesus for yourself this record of death still stands against you condemning you with its legal demands, which is eternal death and God's wrath. But if you turn to him this morning in repentance and in faith and look to him, he will take your sin upon you and give you the righteousness of God. This is the gospel. Secondly, we see that Jesus at the cross won the spiritual war against Satan and his powers. This is who Paul means when he talks about the rulers and authorities in this verse. He means Satan and his demons. So at the cross, Jesus triumphed over the devil and his demons. Hoy, hoy did he? Paul says, by disarming them. Satan's chief weapon, according to one commentator, was his power to accuse God's people of their sin by pointing to the legal debt that they owed God. According to the law of God, the law condemned us. It highlighted the legal debt that we owed God, and Satan, in his accusation, points to that and says, look at this sinner who has rebelled against you. But at the cross, we see Jesus disarming Satan of this weapon. Revelation chapter 12 verse 10 says, Satan accuses God's people day and night before our God. But as we see in verse 14, Jesus has canceled our debt by paying it himself. Therefore, there's nothing left for Satan to accuse. When he points to our sin, he sees it nailed to the cross, paid for in full by the Lord Jesus. He has no power to accuse anymore because of what the Lord Jesus did. Therefore, he has put Satan and his demons to public shame by disarming them and ultimately triumphing over them. them. This is why Jesus set his face to go to the cross and triumph. So you see, at the cross, Jesus won. Not the chief priests or the Pharisees or the Romans or Satan or or his demons. Their hour of darkness lasted but for a moment. At 
the cross, Jesus was triumphant. And today, Jesus is triumphant. You see, the cross was not the end for him. For three days later, he'd be raised to life and raised to reign over everything forever. We've considered how Christ was obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, Paul goes on in chapter 2 of Philippians, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every other name. This was the joy that was set before Jesus, for which he endured the cross and despised its shame. Come back with me to base camp one last time, where we see Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem, to go to the cross. Why did he go? He went in mercy. He went in love. He went in obedience. And he went to win. And his victory continues on to this day and indeed forever. I'll just close by reading a passage in Revelation 5. We sang a hymn earlier, Salvation Belongs to Our God, which is based, based off this chapter. But please do turn with me to Revelation 5. Um, and we'll see this wonderful victory of the Lord Jesus in heaven. Reading from verse 9 says this, and they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation and you have made them a kingdom and priests to your God and they shall reign on the earth. If you remember nothing else from this morning, verse 9 and 10 of Revelation chapter 5 is why Jesus Christ went to the cross to ransom a people for God from every tribe and tongue and nation and language. And, you have, and he has made them a kingdom and priests to God and they shall reign on the earth. This is why Jesus went to the cross. Reading from verse 11, then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels numbering, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Let's pray. Father, this morning we're in awe of our Lord Jesus Christ, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Lord, we look to the cross now as our forgiveness, as our righteousness, as our only hope. And we thank you for it. Lord, we look up and we see the Lord Jesus reigning in heaven. And we ask, Lord Jesus, this morning that you would receive all the glory and honor and blessing and power that is due your name. And all God's people said, Amen.